let me first uh, say that it's a tremendous honor for me uh, to have been selected uh, the 2011 the David uh, Marsden recipient. And it's also, of course, a, a great pleasure for me to uh, talk to you this morning about Parkinson's disease model and mechanism, something that uh, I spend most of my time in the lab uh, thinking about. I uh, thought to uh, show you this uh, picture that was given to me by uh, Dr. Fon, that was uh, in turn given to him by Joe Jankowit. Uh, to illustrate here, as you can see, our director, Stanley Fon, with uh, David Marsden. This picture was taken in uh, 91. And the reason why I sought to show you this morning uh, this picture is because 91 for me has a special resonance. First, of course, is the year that I joined the faculty at Columbia. But also in the context of my lecture today, that was uh, the first time that I had the privilege to meet with uh, David Marsden. And I quite remember vividly that uh, during our first uh, meeting uh, with David, uh, basically he asked me about the work that I was just beginning uh, to do in my brand new lab uh, at Columbia. And he seems quite interested to hear that I was working on mitochondria and MPTP. And I remember also that ever since uh, when I would see him, uh, he would often ask me about how your work on mitochondria is coming along. And for that reason, I said that uh, I will focus my uh, talk today on the mitochondrial story of Parkinson's uh, disease. And what I will try to do is to take you on a journey that will start from David Marsden's time up to now. Before I start, uh, let me reiterate my disclosures. Now, like every story is in uh, my opinion, start with a beginning. And in my uh, opinion, the mitochondrial story of Parkinson's disease starts in the early 80s with MPTP. I will remind you that what happened at that time is that a group of young drunk addicts in California unfortunately uh, uh, inject themselves with street batch of meperidine-like compounds that unfortunately were heavily contaminated with a byproduct. It turned out that uh, this byproduct was identified soon after that as being MPTP. And this unfortunate individual came down quickly in terms of days with a clinical picture that was almost identical to Parkinson's disease. Hmm. So, my apologies for the quality of this video. This is an old film that was converted in digital, but I think that you can still appreciate, nonetheless, the lack of facial expression, the absence of eye blinking showing by this patient, as well as some drooling here. Basically, in the general examination of the patient that continue, you can see that there is a positive of voluntary movements. When movements are initiated, as you can see, they're extremely slow and they seem uh, difficult. Now, if uh, you test for a passive movement, I am sure that you can appreciate the extreme rigidity uh, shown by this uh, individual. And if you pay attention to the hand, I think that you can appreciate a fine resting tremor at the level of the fingers. If you ask the patient to execute uh, rapid alternating movement, you can see that they're hesitant, difficult, extreme small amplitude. And the pull test is extremely uh, pathological. Now, what is the response to treatment in this patient? This is before giving any administration of anti-Parkinsonian therapy. You can appreciate the severe Parkinsonism displayed by this individual. And now about 30 to 60 minutes later, after L-DOPA oral administration, you can see that basically it's night and day in terms of the condition of this individual. I'm pretty sure that if you were to see such a patient in your consult, and we have a lot of uh, expert in Parkinson's disease, uh, the first row and, and in the whole room, of course, don't you think that you would come to the conclusion that this is probably an advanced patient with Parkinson's disease? And if you agree with me, I can tell you that, well, for this time at least, you're wrong. This is one of the examples of a PTP individual. 
And along this line, I want to thank Dr. Langston for sharing this uh, dramatic uh, video uh, for my talk today. So basically now we jump to mid-80s, and you can uh, probably understand that recognizing this striking similarity between MPTP-intoxicated individual and Parkinson's disease, a lot of investigators in the field of Parkinson's disease were very enthusiastic by the idea that if they were uh, studying the toxicokinetics of MPTP, in other words, if they would understand how MPTP is activated and how MPTP works, maybe they will have some insight into the neurobiology of Parkinson's disease, and more importantly, they may be able to think about how to devise effective therapies for this condition. From 84 to at least the 90s, a lot of very elegant studies have been done. I listed some of them at the bottom of my slides that dissect the, the complex multi-step toxicokinetics of the toxins. But uh, for my talk today, I would like to jump directly inside the dopaminergic neurons. And so what is happening here is that once MPP+, plus, which is the active metabolites of MPTP, enter dopaminergic neurons, it will be quickly concentrated inside the mitochondria. What do you have in the mitochondria? Well, among other things, you have the electron transport chain. Here, uh, this depiction basically shows the uh, electron transport chain that it's composed of these uh, large enzymatic complexes that are embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And what is happening normally is that the electron will flow from one complex to another, and basically through this flow, ATPase, which is here, will synthesize, uh, synthesize ATP. What was shown by many investigators at the time, including Bill Nicholas, Ramsey, and Dr. Mizuno, is that MPP+, plus, when it's concentrated into the mitochondria, it will sit at the level of complex one, as you can see here. And in doing so, it will interrupt the flow, the normal flow of electrons that normally go down the chain. And that will have immediate two consequences. First, the electron that accumulate upstream to the block will stimulate the production of a local oxidative stress, and because there is no more electrons that flow down the chain, you deactivate ATPase, and there will be a shortage of ATP leading to energy crisis. Now we are in the early 90s, and probably will not come as a surprise if I'm telling you that most investigators recognizing this striking phenotypic similarity between MPTP patient and Parkinson's disease, and knowing now that basically MPTP killed dopaminergic neurons by inhibiting complex one, led to the idea that perhaps there is a deficit in complex one activity in Parkinson as well. And so naturally, researcher in the field harvested ventral midbrain tissue from Parkinsonian patient and controls and assess in this tissue the activity of many of the complexes that compose the electron transport chain. And sure enough, what it was found is that if you compare the complex one activity in control versus PD sample, there was a reduction of roughly 25 to 30 percent. At the end of this type of investigation, you can understand the enthusiasm of the field, thinking that that's it. A deficit in complex one is the ideological factors of Parkinson's disease. But quickly, unfortunately, a lot of skepticism start to mount in the field. And the reason, at least some of the reasons, are listed here. The first one was the fact that, don't forget, that those investigations were derived from using autopsic material. And so, the, therefore, it was very unlikely that this deficit on complex one that was reported could reflect anything that could have happened in dopaminergic neurons since those sample are end-stage PD, meaning almost devoid of any dopaminergic neurons. The second argument was that perhaps at least part of this complex one reduction could be an artifact of treatment. Remember that advanced patients are virtually all treated with, uh, chronically with high dose of anti-Parkinsonian uh, therapies. And as we showed in 93, for example, the chronic infusion, at least in rats, of levodopa will reduce complex one activity in the brain. Additional arguments came from experts of mitochondrial field. And those people, like Salvatore Di Mora at Columbia University, would argue that he would see a lot of patients with complex one activity deficit, which are known to be related to a known mutation in the mitochondrial genome. And yet, he almost never see in any of these patients any features that will be reminiscent of Parkinsonism. 
And when you see such rare cases, as we report with Dominic when he was uh, at Columbia in 2000, it will never be a pure picture of Parkinson's disease. In, in fact, the, the paper that we report in such an instance with a patient with Parkinsonism and mutation in the mitochondrial genome also I should say, associated deafness and neuropathy, something that I'm sure you will never accept as part of the picture of Parkinson's disease. So by the mid-90s, basically, the consensus in the field was there is no evidence that PD could be due to mitochondrial uh, genetic defect. And from there, basically, we really entered about five years period during which the idea of mitochondrial defect in Parkinson's disease was put on life support. Until Tim Grunemeyer and his, and his group had an idea how we can possibly revive this idea of mitochondrial defect. And what Tim thought was, well, maybe it's not a mutation indeed. Don't forget that after all, MPTP that give rise to a form of Parkinsonism is a toxin. It's not a mutation. And so why not to think about this whole story from a very different angle, from the angle of an environmental toxins? And here he thought that perhaps the culprit could be rotenone or some homologs of this compound. And the reason why he thought that is because rotenone is known to be a potent complex one poison, and it's also known to be worldwide quite extensively used as a pesticide. Sure enough, his group uh, decided to infuse rats with rotenone, and what they showed here, as demonstrated on these slides, is that they were capable with this type of strategies to damage the dopaminergic system. Not only that, but if you look at the NAGRA and pay attention to the few remaining dopaminergic neurons in retinone-treated rats, what he found is that some of these neurons will display the typical proteinutious inclusion reminiscent of Lowy body. Despite a lot of enthusiasm around the year 2000, yet there was some reservation to the idea that PD could be due to a environmental injury, and the reason why was mainly based on epidemiological data, which fail, with rare exception, to demonstrate clustered of Parkinson's uh, patient. And that's what probably you would expect if PD was due to environmental factor. Yet this idea of environmental insult did not die out because only two years later, an alternative explanation to environmental injury or contribution came along. And basically, that was stimulated by the demonstration that extra copies encoding for normal gene of synuclein could give rise to a familial form of Parkinson's disease. And not only that, but as you can see on this table, greater was the number of copies and more severe was the PD phenotype. And so that led many people in the field of Parkinson's research, including ourselves, to think, aha, perhaps the level of expression of synuclein represent a predisposing factor. So that may explain, if you put that in conjunction with an environmental injury, why some people may develop upon exposure to the environmental toxicant, the disease, why others may not. This was a very exciting uh, hypothesis of genetic environmental interactions. And basically, when Bill Dower was still at Columbia, now he's a faculty at the University of Michigan, we had the idea that perhaps this exciting hypothesis could be tested experimentally. And the way we thought of doing that, it's basically to take advantage of Bill's expertise in mouse genetic. And he thought that he could generate engineered animal that will provide us with different level of expression of synuclein to play on the genetic predisposition side of the equation. And then we can use MPTP as a system model to emulate a environmental injury. So uh, through the mice that, in mutant mice that Bill uh, generated, we, were, we had now in hand animals that express either normal level of synuclein, have the level of synuclein, or no synuclein at all. And then Miguel Villa, when he was in the lab with me, we decided to challenge all these animals with MPTP. And the conclusion of these studies showed that lower was the level of synuclein and greater was the resistance to the toxicity, consistent with the idea that perhaps, indeed, the level of synuclein may modulate our susceptibility to some kind of environmental toxin. 
And to me, really from then on, which is about the, the mid-2000, I would say that the enthusiasm for the idea of mitochondrial uh, pathology in Parkinson's disease did not stop to increase. First, with this elegant study uh, published by Bender and collaborator in 2006, what they have done here is to harvest the uh, genetic material contained in the few dopaminergic neurons that remain in the substitution nigra of Parkinson patient and compare this material to the one collected from normal controls. And what they found is that in PD, there was a major uh, increase in the content of DNA damage and particularly of mitochondrial DNA damage. They hypothesized at this point that the reason why you could have a greater amount of mitochondrial DNA damage in PD could be because of an increased oxidative stress within the mitochondria. And very elegantly, they showed that by virtue of having all this copious amount of mitochondrial DNA uh, uh, damage, those cells exhibit a reduced bioenergetic uh, activity. Even further supporting the idea of mitochondrial defect in Parkinson's disease came from the explosion of human genetic uh, in Parkinson's disease. Indeed, soon after these different gene defects have been identified, at least two immediately point toward maybe a possible connection to mitochondria, and that is DJ1 and PINK1. And more recently, a third one linked to mutation in Parkin was also uh, connected to different mechanisms by which Parkin may modulate mitochondrial function, and we'll come back on this point in a few minutes. So now I believe that we reaching our last stretch of our journey. And looking uh, close to our finish line, I still want to discuss with you three set of recent data, which I believe provide us with a wealth of molecular insight as to how we can think connecting mitochondrial function to Parkinson pathogenesis. The first one, I will call it the PGC1-alpha story. Basically, what happened here is that in 2010-2011, uh, uh, there have been a huge uh, group of uh, collaborators coming together to analyze the genetic material collected from more than 400 PD patients. And this genetic material was meta-analyzed by a very elegant set of bioinformatic algorithms. And what this study shows is that there was a strongest association between PD and gene alteration in those genes that encode for mitochondrial respiration and glucose metabolism, i.e. bioenergetics. Uh, bio Even more importantly, they showed that you could explain all these alterations by looking at the reduction in expression of one common factor that regulates the expression of all these genes, PGC1-alpha. In less than a year, Further data came along to support the idea of PGC1-alpha in PD. And here, basically, this order uh, uh, proposed a scenario by which you could connect or try to begin to understand how PGC1-alpha could be repressed in Parkinson's disease. And the idea that they had is the following. The scenario will start with basically revolving around Parkin altered function. And we already know that Parkin altered function can be due either to a familial mutations, like we know in familial form of PD, or in sporadic PD, they propose that perhaps the function of Parkin could be altered by oxidative stress. Once you have a loss of Parkin activity, basically you will have a dysregulation of Paris, which is a new factor, and it's not necessary to elaborate any further. Needless to say that when that happened, through Paris, there would be a repression of PGC1-alpha. Once PGC1-alpha is repressed, there is an inhibition in the synthesis of key factor of the bioenergetic in the mitochondria, and then not surprisingly, in consequence of which, you will have defect in bioenergetics. The second set of data has more to do with cell physiology. In fact, in this study, what the investigator have shown is that the electrical signature 
of the most susceptible neurons in Parkinson's disease, i.e. dopaminergic neurons in the Subshant Shinagra, have a very different electrical pacemaking than other dopaminergic neurons that are less susceptible the, to Parkinson's disease, such as the ventral tegmental dopaminergic neurons. The order also in this study shows that in response to this particular pacemaking activity, nigral neurons have a dysregulation in calcium metabolism, leading to a greater load of cytosolic calcium. And biomechanism, as you can see here from the dash uh, arrows, biomechanism that remain to be elucidated, they show very convincingly that you have an increase in free radical production inside the mitochondria that I called reactive oxygen species, or ROS. From this model, it's of course tantalizing to go back to the Bender model, if you remember, where they showed that in the nigral neurons, you have more mitochondrial DNA damage, perhaps because of an increased ROS. Well, here it is. This is your ROS. And so what it would mean is that indeed, because of this abnormal pacemaking, you will have more ROS, more mitochondrial DNA damage, and therefore more dysfunctional mitochondria. But wait a minute. If this is the case, then you can argue if nigral neurons, even at baseline, because I was talking about normal situation just before, why are nigral neurons do not drop dead even in normal individual? Well, it's because in all our cells, what do we have is not only we produce damaged mitochondria all the time, but we have quality control mechanisms that identify those bad mitochondria and that eliminate them so that the cell always remains with a normal pool of mitochondria and a healthy functional status. And I think that it's really at the level of this quality control mechanism that pink one and probably in collaboration with Parkin, play a key role. This quality control has something to do with autophagy. It's also called mitophagy, and we'll discuss that in a minute. But before we go to mitophagy, I would like to uh, stress one point of topology. So here I showed you a blow up of the two membrane of the mitochondria. And the only reason why I want to show you that, you will see in a minute, it's because in our lab a few years ago, we have shown that part of pink one, which is a mitochondrial kinase, sits at the level of the outer membrane, having its functional domain here in red, facing the cytoplasm. And the only reason why I stress this element of topology is that, as you will see, if we were to imagine that pink one and Parkin do functionally interact, Parkin, it's mainly recognized as a cytosolic enzyme. This is a mitochondrial protein. And so we have to imagine a way where this protein, in fact, and Parkin can see each other if we invoke interaction. So, and here's the illustration of the interaction. So basically, this is a normal cell that expresses Parkin. Parkin is in yellow, and you can see it's diffusely expressed as one will expect for a cytosolic protein. Now, if you take those cells and expose them to a chemical that kill the membrane potential, and does, it's not very important to know uh, what membrane potential means, it's simply a surrogate model of mitochondrial damage. Basically, what you see is that Parkin will uh, display a complete distinct uh, appearance from a diffuse staining to a punctate staining. And if you wonder what those punctates are, you can stain the cell for mitochondrial marker here in red, and you can see that there is an excellent colocalization of the two markers, suggesting that what happened is that in response to mitochondrial damage, Parkin, it's migrated from the cytosol to the mitochondria. But as we showed in 2010, this migration is pink one dependent, so this other protein sitting at the level of mitochondria. Indeed, if you have uh, a mull of bad mitochondria in the presence of Parkin, but you eliminate of the equation pink one, you can see that Parkin remain in the cytosol and do not take this punctate appearance. Now, what happened once Parkin decorate those mitochondria? in a situation where you have a mull of damaged mitochondria. Well, basically, what happened is that quickly after this, you see a uh, collapse of the normal network of mitochondria that normally distribute throughout the cells. Here, the mitochondria that are Parkin positive will quickly form clusters, and those clusters will move in the perinuclear area of the cell. 
where you have a rich area of lysosome and the colocalization between positive Parkin mitochondria with lysosome is illustrated in this box where basically we see Parkin mitochondria positive that colocalize with marker of autophagy as well as uh, autophagosome. Now, what is the model that we can draw from all of this? Basically, as I said, we generating domage mitochondria all the time. Those domage mitochondria are recognized. They are trafficked to the perinuclear area where lysosome resides. They are engulfed in the lysosome. They are destroyed. And as such, thanks to this quality control mechanism, as I said before, the cell can maintain a normal pool of mitochondria and a normal function. And we think that it's in this quality control machinery that Park and Pink One play a key role. Now, what happened in Parkinson's disease then? Well, if we look at the possible situation that may occur in a familial form of PD where you have mutation uh, in Pink One Parkin that kill the function of these two proteins, here's the situation. In normal a cell that express normal Parkin and Pink One, if you have damaged mitochondria, as we saw before, you have the formation of these mitochondria in the perinuclear area. Those big clusters that are easy to see, if now you replace pink one, normal pink one, with the PD form of pink one, in this two slide, uh, uh, inset, you can see that those clusters do not form. So what it means is that in the presence of PD mutation, basically the cell, despite the fact that it will dis have a lot of damaged mitochondria, will not be able to recruit the quality control mechanism. So what is the scenario that we can propose that will connect mitochondrial defect to Parkinson's disease pathogenesis in light of all these new information? So let's start from a normal cell. Basically, the starting point would be this abnormal electrophysiological signature that we already uh, demonstrate or discuss that will lead to a greater amount of mitochondrial damage, but the cell since it can recruit normally and efficiently its mechanism of quality control called mitophagy, remain healthy and functional. Now in PD, whether it's called by, uh, caused by environmental factor, genetic factors, or probably a combination of the two, we believe that the first part of the equation remained the same, but here we can plug the new information that we have uh, discussed today, which is either the parking Paris PGC1 alpha story that, as I discussed before, will generate a greater amount of dysfunctional mitochondria. Or alternatively, we can plug, and it's not mutually exclusive, the Parkin pink one story that, as I showed, will lead to a inability of the cell to engage properly its mechanism of mitophagy. The end result is the same, whether you produce more dysfunctional mitochondria or you eliminate less dis uh, uh, dysfunctional mitochondria, you would have over time in these dopaminergic neurons a progressive rise in the proportion of bad mitochondria over good mitochondria. And at some point, you would be in a situation that you will cross the pathological threshold, leading to neuronal dysfunction and ultimately to neuronal death. My take-home messages uh, today, based on my talk, I would like to stress five points. The first one is that I believe that the initial data on bioenergetics in PD were descriptive and correlative. Now that we have some molecular insight as to how bioenergetic in PD may be affected, I still believe that it's fair to say that there is no compelling evidence to suggest that bioenergetic defect in PD is a primary problem of PD. Yet, that doesn't mean that I don't believe that bioenergetic is not important in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. On the contrary, I think it is important, but probably it is a secondary consequences of other cellular perturbations that we have discussed uh, today. Nonetheless, whether it's primary or secondary, I think the end result, as I said, will be the same, which is that it revolves around dysfunctional mitochondria that ultimately has the ability to kill cells. But I would not like to leave you under the impression that what I'm suggesting is that if there were a bioenergetic defect, this is the sole and unique pathogenic mechanism of Parkinson's disease. On the contrary, I believe that even in the presence of bioenergetic, the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease is the fruit of a multifactorial cascade of deleterious events. Some of these are cell autonomous, meaning that they take place inside the dopaminergic neurons. They can be Parkinson defect, 
PGC1 alpha alteration, calcium dyseomeostasis, and they work together with other deleterious mechanism called non-selotonomous, meaning that they take place outside the dopaminergic neurons, but still they will turn against dopaminergic neurons themselves and precipitate their demise. And along this line, I think that the center stage is occupied by neuroinflammation, which I have not discussed today. Let me stop here, acknowledging the member of my lab. In green, you have the graduate students. In blue, the former member of the lab who have contributed to the data that I showed you today. Here on the right, you have our collaborators. And of course, our source of support without which nothing could have been done. And along this line, I would particularly want to acknowledge the support of the Parkinson's Disease Foundation of New York, which was the very first to provide me with support when I started my lab in 1991. Thank you very much.